Hello everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. I am Tamakshi Vasan, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Academic Programs at the Pilotma Foundation. Pilotma Foundation works globally in the areas of international relations, diplomacy, area studies, gender, environmental, financial, scientific, strategic, and defense policy. It's my pleasure to host this strategic insight session on the theme of military strategy and counterinsurgency wars of the 21st century organized by the Tilutama Foundation. At the outset, let me specially thank Mr. Soham Das, Chairperson and Director of the Tilutama Foundation, for his constant support, guidance, and encouragement. We at the Tilutama Foundation are committed to enhancing knowledge, promoting critical thinking, and exchange of ideas. As we all know, military strategy and counterinsurgency have become increasingly significant in the 21st century due to the changing nature of warfare and the emergence of new threats. Military strategy refers to the overarching plan, an approach employed by a nation's military forces to achieve their objectives in a conflict of war. It involves making decisions on how to allocate resources, deploy forces, and employ tactics to gain a favorable outcome. The military strategy takes into account factors such as the enemy's capabilities, the geopolitical landscape, available resources, and the desired political objectives. On the other hand, counterinsurgency refers to the measures taken by a government and its military forces to defeat or neutralize an insurgency. Unlike conventional warfare, counterinsurgency focuses on winning the support of the local population, addressing the root causes of the insurgency, and marginalizing or eliminating the insurgent group. It involves a combination of military, political, economic, and social measures aimed at neutralizing the insurgency and establishing long-term stability. Over the years, military diplomacy has emerged as a significant instrument for enforcing foreign policy and maintaining national security. It is important to understand and analyze the various military strategies and tactics employed in counterinsurgency operations as they play a crucial role in shaping the outcome of conflicts. Moreover, it is essential to recognize the interdisciplinary nature of military strategy and counterinsurgency operations. As rightly stated, the insurgency is primarily a political struggle rather than a military confrontation. In this regard, it is important to consider the political and humanitarian implications of military strategies and tactics in counterinsurgency operations. Therefore, today's session aims to provide an in-depth understanding of military strategy and counterinsurgency in the 21st century by exploring various aspects such as the evolution of military operations, challenges and opportunities faced by the armed forces in counterinsurgency warfare, the role of technology in modern warfare, etc. I'm sure our special speaker for today will provide valuable insights and perspectives to enhance our understanding of the complex an evolving nature of military strategy and counterinsurgency operations. I'm pleased to welcome our noted speaker for today, Dr. John A. Nanthar, Associate Professor of War Fighting Studies, U.S. Army War College. He is a former Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army. Dr. Nagar's expertise in the domain of military strategy and counterinsurgency operations is widely recognized with publications such as Learning to Eat Soup for the Night, Counterinsurgency Lessons from Malaya and Vietnam, and How to Eat Soup with a Spoon, a Guide to Civil-Military Coordination. Today's session has a special focus on the topic of military strategy and counterinsurgency in contemporary conflict scenarios. Thank you, Dr. Nagel, for being here at the Purotama Foundation and sharing your valuable insights on today's special theme of military strategy and counterinsurgency, wars of the 21st century. It's so good to see you and hear from you on this important topic. I would now like to request Dr. Nagel to start with this presentation. Over to you, Dr. Nagel. Uh, thank you for those kind words. Thanks to all of you for tuning in on what I believe to be a Friday night in India. It's uh, coming up for lunchtime here in Pennsylvania, where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, and I'm disappointed that you've all made such bad life choices that you're listening to a talk on counterinsurgency on a Friday evening. But I will try to keep it as interesting as I can. 
Um, and and I, I have to start off by saying that uh, while I'm going to talk uh, uh, about Army things, and while I work for the U.S. Army War College here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where we are, are privileged to have at least one Indian officer every year, and I was actually with that Indian officer this week in Washington, D.C., uh, I do not speak on behalf of the United States Army, the Department of Defense, nor the U.S. Army War College. And as you'll see from my comments, some of the things that I say uh, are things that the Army doesn't like to hear. And I, I hope that makes it a little more interesting for you. Interestingly, however, uh, the Army chose to publish these ideas uh, in, in a piece titled Why America's Army Can't Win America's Wars, in the journal Parameters, which is the journal of the U.S. Army War College, and they published that last summer. If you're interested, you can uh, click on that, and maybe Dr. Wasson can, can uh, using her mad computing skills, can find the link to it and put it in the chat for those who might be interested. But but so the, the title of my talk is Why America's Army Can't Win America's Wars. And if, if you're only going to be with us for a few minutes, if you have something better to do, uh, uh, the, the short answer is America's army can't win America's wars because America's enemies are not fighting us as conventional opponents anymore because they know that they would lose and lose badly. Instead, they're choosing to fight us as insurgents and terrorists. And that's just a whole lot harder for the American military, the American national security establishment to win that kind of war. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. And and uh, my expectation continues to be, even as Washington is full of talk uh, about the war in Ukraine, as it should be, uh, about uh, a pending war with China, which it shouldn't be in my eyes, uh, and, and India has a role to play in keeping that war from happening, um, and, and uh, I'm grateful for India's help in that. We can talk about that if you'd like, uh, but these, I believe, are the kind of wars that we will continue to see, and so my thesis when I talk to American audiences, is that these are the kind of wars we need to get better at fighting. So that's the too long didn't read or too long didn't listen on a Friday night version of the talk. I'm now going to go into a little more detail for it. So you should now have, I'm hoping, a picture of Teddy Roosevelt in the Spanish-American War. Is that the picture you have? Dr. Watson says, yes, terrific. So I'm going to start my talk here because I believe that it was the Spanish-American War that marked America's entry to great power status. It was the first time America defeated a great power uh, other than the American Revolution. Um, uh, but, but America was clearly not a great power um, at, at the time of the American Revolution. It was not a great power at the time of the War of 1812. Really, the, the Civil War unleashed the, the latent military power of the United States and the U.S. brought it to bear in the Spanish-American War. And of course, the United States won that war pretty decisively. Um, and and um, uh, America became a force to be reckoned with in, um, in world affairs uh, right at the turn of the last century, right around 1900. Uh, although uh, as part of that war, there was a very difficult fight uh, against insurgents in the Philippines that uh, gave uh, the American army huge headaches. Uh, but but that marked the entry of the United States into the, the world of global affairs. Uh, America was late to uh, its next war, to the First World War, didn't enter until 1917, by which point the European countries were largely exhausted. The American contribution in World War I was ultimately decisive. Um, the, France was uh, exhausted by, by the time American troops started arriving in 1917, but it was the American troops that turned the tide, not necessarily because of their terrific fighting potential, not because of America's industrial might, although both of those things helped. But but the, the countries of Europe had, had uh, essentially defeated, um, worn each other out uh, by that point, and, and the, the vigor of uh, America, the strength of America, tipped the scales. Sadly, in my opinion, uh, in the wake of the First World War, American attempts to continue to engage in world politics fell flat. Woodrow Wilson was not able to get American support for the League of Nations. 
And just one generation after the First World War, the war to win, end all wars, uh, the United States uh, and, and the world got to fight an even worse war than the First World War. The Second World War, I call it World War I, Part Two. Uh, America still entered late, my British friends would say, but but not as late. Uh, as as we had uh, entered World War One, and and without a doubt, America's uh, influence, the influence of the American military, uh, the American industrial base was defight decisive in the Second World War. Um, uh, uh, American uh, troops in both Europe and in Asia, I would argue, were were. What what led um, this is one of uh, a, a funny T-shirt you'll see sometimes in uh, in gyms things like that. Uh, uh, American uh, will will wear two time World War champs undefeated in World Wars, um, but but by the end of the Second World War and in particular when America was in sole possession of nuclear weapons, uh, America was without a doubt the most powerful country in the world, and I would argue at the end of World War II was the most powerful country in world history. The World World War II actually helped the United States. By the end of World War II, the United States uh, had, had grown in strength and power. America was producing more than half of world gross domestic product. The war had largely not been fought on American soil. And, and though Americans made sacrifices all over the globe, um, it, it, it was... Um, uh, a, a net gain for American power. And that's where this story, I think, gets interesting. Uh, because since World War II, the most powerful nation in world history, the greatest power on the planet, has not won very many wars, and it's lost a bunch of wars. And as a student of the American military, a student of the American army, one of the questions I try to answer is why? Why has America, with all that power, not used it very effectively, not won very many wars? And, and so what I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about now is why that was. In the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, as an Iron Curtain descended across both Europe and Asia, uh, uh, one of the surprises um, of that war was uh, first the North Korean uh, attack on South Korea, and then after uh, American efforts to, to successful uh, efforts to push North Korean forces back, uh, in particular, Douglas MacArthur's Incheon landing is one clear moment of strategic genius. Uh, the Chinese uh, um, entered as American troops got close to the Yalu. Uh, and, and the Korean War seesawed back down the peninsula, the front uh, uh, ultimately freezing uh, about the midpoint of the peninsula. And, and the, the lesson of the Korean War, I think, is, is that America was unprepared, a word I'm going to use often today, was unprepared to fight a war. Uh, the American troops uh, in Japan uh, were were soft. They were on occupation duty. They were not ready to fight. Uh, and and uh, the the North Koreans and then the Chinese caught America on ready for war. We literally, uh, in the early days of the Korean War, took American tanks off of display pedestals. They've been put up outside buildings on military posts to look cool. And we literally took the tanks off of the pedestals, uh, greased them up put gas into them, put them on, on boats and ships and sent them to Korea to fight in the war. We didn't have enough weapon systems ready to do what needed doing. Uh, but but ultimately, uh, really under the leadership of, of the man in the center of this picture here, Matt Ridgway, uh, a, a terrific uh, fighter. Yeah, those are those are live grenades strapped to his belt. That was his signature uh, that, that he, he was a war fighting general, not a parade ground general. Uh, Matt Ridgway, uh, among others, turned that war around. And ultimately, I think it's safe to say that the Korean War, which which is, is under an armistice, that, that war has never officially ended, uh, ended up to be roughly a tie. And America learned important lessons about military preparedness as it assumed responsibility for global peace and security. Um, that, that, that outcome could have been worse. I'm going to call, call that one a tie. 
Um, it, it's hard to imagine our next war, however, going much worse. This is the, the Vietnam War is, is the most confusing war, I think, in American history. It's unbelievably difficult to understand. The, the historic historiography of it is deeply disputed. I'm speaking on a panel at Yale uh, in a couple of weeks uh, talking about Vietnam in, in some depth, and I'm happy to uh, talk about it in depth. If if you're interested, it's it's part of the subject of um, of the book Dr. Wasson mentioned of of learning to eat soup with a knife, which was my doctoral dissertation. My shorthand on on Vietnam is that uh, an America that was ready to fight the Korean War over again uh, by this point, uh, ten years later, was not ready to fight the Viet Cong. Was not ready to fight irregular forces who did not. Um, fight in uniform, did not use conventional tactics, but but fought as guerrillas and insurgents. Uh, and and um, ultimately, when a great power loses a small war, and, and the United States clearly a great power in the 1960s, Vietnam uh, not a great power, and, and Vietnam not a full-scale war, not a world war, uh, the great power loses that war at home. And, and ultimately in Vietnam, the United States decided to stop supporting the people of South Vietnam, the army of South Vietnam. And, and ultimately, uh, America was defeated in that war in, in absolute abject failure. Helicopters off the roof of the embassy kind of failure. And if you, if you haven't seen the videos of uh, those helicopters were flying out to uh, American ships, um, in the Pacific, and and as the ships filled up with helicopters, they pushed American sailors, American soldiers, pushed perfectly good helicopters off of the decks uh, of the ships to make room for more helicopters coming in. It's uh, astounding to see uh, that kind of, of uh, expenditure of resources of American tax dollars, uh, but that, that it's a sign of, a symbol of the... Um, extraordinary defeat of American arms in Vietnam, um, still in a, in a lot of ways our, our hardest and more difficult war. Uh, America fought fought a number of very small conflicts, none that wouldn't, well, I would I would argue, rose to the status of a war for uh, a generation after Vietnam, uh, but, but after that pause, um, finally got to fight the war that it had wanted to fight ever since. World War II and Operation uh, that Sparky, Hush Sparky, uh, got, got to fight uh, the war that they'd always wanted to fight in Operation Desert Storm. Spark, uh, Sparky is killing me. Uh, in in uh, um, Saddam Hussein decided that Iraq wasn't quite uh, big enough. He, he uh, in a lightning strike, in a blitzkrieg strike, took Kuwait and um, President George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, uh, stated that this aggression will not stand. I actually was in uh, one of the tanks, uh, very possibly one of the tanks you can see uh, on this screen, extraordinary um, display of American power. I was on the, the far left of, of America's left hook into Iraq. And uh, in Operation Desert Storm, the American military took the Iraqi army from the fourth largest in the world to the second largest in Iraq in a period of just 100 hours. It was the war America wanted to fight. Signs went up on the Pentagon that said, we only do deserts. President H.W. Uh, Bush said, uh, by God, we've licked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Uh, but the truth is that we hadn't. Um, and and um, most importantly, the world watched as the American military defeated uh, Iraqi tanks that uh, conveniently for us lined up in rows. Uh, there were tanks that, that didn't look like ours and uh, we shot them from ranges they couldn't possibly imagine. American air power, American technology, nascent global positioning system technology, all um, conspired to give give the American military after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, undisputed claim to being the most powerful nation in the world, the most powerful military in the world. 
And as, as the American military celebrated its triumph, I wasn't so sure. I thought our win was so decisive that no other country would choose to ever fight us that way again. Instead, I believed uh, they would choose to fight us more as they had in Vietnam than as they had in Operation Desert Storm. And that thought led me to write my book, Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, Counterinsurgency Lessons from Malaya and Vietnam, which uh, when it was published, uh, former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich said, John Noggle's brilliant book is probably the best book on counterinsurgency written by an American in modern times. And I am very comfortable telling you that Newt Gingrich was right, because at the time he said that, my book was the only book on counterinsurgency written by an American in modern times. The presses in the field, the, the two top presses in my field at that time were Cornell and Princeton, and neither of them would publish it in the late 1990s because they said counterinsurgency and counterterrorism were yesterday's news. There was no, there were no prospects for a book on that subject. And, and they wrote back to me and told me that in the year 2000. And of course, a year later, it turned out that the best presses in international relations in the United States were wrong. After the attacks of September 11th, 2001, waged by Osama bin Laden and his group of radical Islamic terrorists, Al-Qaeda, um, uh, waged from, uh, staged from Afghanistan, uh, the United States demanded that the Taliban, then ruling Afghanistan, uh, hand over bin Laden and the leadership of al-Qaeda for justice. The Taliban refused to do so, and America invaded Afghanistan in an extraordinary campaign. Uh, American special forces working with local Afghan groups, including perhaps most importantly the Northern Alliance, all supported by American air power, toppled the Taliban uh, in, in uh, a period of about two months. By December 2001, uh, Al-Qaeda had fled, uh, the Taliban uh, had been defeated, and the United States was in control in Afghanistan. So began America's longest war, our war in Afghanistan, uh, and sadly, like Vietnam, a war that ended in absolutely abject failure for the United States. Uh, helicopters lifting off the roof of the embassy failure, uh, because uh, the, the Taliban, other insurgents, fought us uh, as, as fish swimming among the sea of the people. And uh, uh, ultimately, America decided not to continue to support the Afghan government, the Afghan soldiers. It had created, it had funded, it had paid, and America had its second crushing defeat uh, at, at the hands of irregular warriors. Although uh, uh, the, the invasion of Afghanistan in my eyes was entirely just, it was poorly conducted, uh, poorly planned, uh, not well executed, not properly resourced, uh, there is, is no doubt in my eyes that it was a just war. Uh, I have uh, a very hard time telling you that the same is true for America's next war, the invasion of Iraq in March 2003. Uh, that that uh, country, Iraq, had nothing whatsoever to do with the attacks of September 11th. Uh, Saddam Hussein would not, who was in control of Iraq then, would not have allowed Al Qaeda or any other terror groups to have used Iraq as a base from which to attack the United States uh, or its friends or allies. Saddam had had uh, was a, a, a very bad man, uh, but it had a, a terrific um, control over his country. Um, uh, so that the the um, Iraq is in fact bad. Um, though that's not me doing the writing, but I agree that uh, the invasion of Iraq was. Tom Ricks in his book Fiasco says that the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was the most profligate act, the worst foreign policy decision made by the United States in its history. I agree with that assessment. And while Iraq continues uh, to, to 
um, function as, as some degree of democracy in the Middle East, it is impossible for any American to argue that it was a victory in any meaningful sense of the word. Uh, instead, um, Iraq was yet another defeat uh, for the American arms in the, in the face of an insurgency. And, and so uh, since, since the United States became a hegemon, since the United States became the most powerful country in the world, um, we have not done very well. We've learned some important lessons. We've learned in Korea that wars come without notice and that readiness is, is important. And, and the United States has created uh, uh, at enormous expense uh, very capable, very ready military forces that serve around the globe, including in South Korea, uh, ready to fight tonight, as uh, which is the motto of the 2nd Infantry Division. And, and so um, that, that's an important lesson learned. Counting Desert Storm and, and Korea, uh, respectively, as, as a win, which I think is fair, and a tie, which I also think is fair, our record in conventional wars since we became the most powerful state in the, on the planet is, is an acceptable 1-0 oh, and 1, but our record in irregular war is simply abysmal. And the reason why is, is, why, uh, it, is an important question uh, that uh, we're talking about. The reason we're here today is to talk about why the United States has not performed better in irregular war. And the short answer there is that irregular warfare is hard and soldiers don't like fighting it. And, and I, I, I share that, having, having uh, fought in, in both wars in Iraq, Desert Storm, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, Desert Storm was a much easier war to understand, a much easier war to fight. If I had to, to do it over again, uh, despite being fat and old, I would do Desert Storm 10 times over rather than do my year in El Anbar, Iraq in 2003 and 2004 over again, even one time. Uh, why? why? Why have we performed so badly? Why didn't we learn more lessons from Vietnam? Um, and and to, to, to understand that, I think you, you, you have to understand some of American military history and American military culture. Uh, the picture of the, the soldier here is, is Jack Keane, uh, who was vice chief of staff of the Army. And Jack Keane said on, on camera in 2006, during some of the darker days of the Iraq War, said, we put an army on the battlefield that he'd been a part of for 37 years at that point, that didn't have any doctrine, wasn't educated or trained to deal with insurgency. After Vietnam, General Keene said, we purged ourselves of everything that had to do with irregular warfare or insurgency. And in hindsight, he says, that was a bad decision. And I, I couldn't possibly agree more with General Keene on that point. But it isn't just the generals who thought so. Thought so. Secretary of Defense, uh, Bob Gates, in my eyes, perhaps our, our best Secretary of Defense since 1947, since the office was created. Secretary Gates said in 2007, in front of the assembled generals of the Army at the Association of the United States Army annual conference in 2007, General Gates really let the generals have it with both barrels. He said in the years following the Vietnam War, the Army relegated unconventional war to the margins, leaving the service unprepared to deal with what followed. Somalia, Haiti, the Balkans, most recently, or Afghanistan and Iraq, the consequences and costs of which we are still struggling with today. Uh, that the unprepared is not a word you want your Minister of Defense to use in relation to your army. And so um, pretty rough, pretty rough stuff from Gates for his army generals. That's the bad news. The good news is we learned, we got better. And I was a part of the team that wrote. Uh, the Army Marine Corps uh, Counterinsurgency Field Manual, published in 2006, published as an Army Field Manual, FM 324, and also as a Marine Corps Warfighting Pamphlet 333.5. Uh, I, I was committed to the 2006 effort, deeply involved in writing that one, uh, under the leadership of then Lieutenant Generals Jim Mattis, later Secretary of Defense, and Dave Petraeus, later Director of Central Intelligence. I was uh, involved, uh, but not committed to the writing of the 2014 manual, which I think is actually a better product. They, they got, they, they, they learned and improved. But the key, um, so the, the, the um, picture on the left is, is drawn from the 2006 manual. The, the um, picture on the right is drawn from the 2014 manual. 
And we could talk for easily eight hours just on this slide, but uh, so as not to do that. Um, in, an, in an insurgency, when you're fighting on the, the left-hand uh, slide, relatively small number of, of insurgents, uh, but but supported by neutral or or passive uh, members of the population and, and some who support the government or coalition, your objective over time is to reduce the number of terrorists or insurgents, reduce the number of people who are neutral or passive by increasing the number of people, convincing people to support the government or coalition. How do you do that? You do combat operations against the enemy wherever you can find them. You train and employ host nation security forces provide services to the population, give them good governance and economic development. And you wrap that all up in information operations because ultimately these are wars of ideas you're trying to change people's minds. That was the theory of victory for both Iraq and Afghanistan and future counterinsurgent kind of wars in 2006. The 2014 manual says essentially the same thing. It continues to wrap uh, this time five rather than six lines of, op of operation inside information operations, but it elevates host nation security force development to be as important as information operations in enabling the end state we're trying to achieve. Ultimately, you're not going to defeat the insurgency as an outside power. What you wanna do is reduce it in strength, in, in uh, location, in uh, geographic uh, spread, and, and you, you want to bring the insurgency down while increasing the capabilities of the host nation and the host nation security forces so that they can handle it. That's your exit strategy, probably leaving a force of some advisors and some air power behind in support, but they'll be doing most of the fighting. And, and so uh, I, I think the doctrine is right. I, I would think that uh, having, having uh, written it and then helped a little bit as they uh, um, uh, improved it in 2014, uh, but but there are um, terrific debates to be had over the doctrine, and I'm happy to have that conversation. That's probably the slide I'll pull up for questions if you're interested. There is much more to do in doctrine and organization and training and education and material leadership development, uh, picking the right people uh, to fight this kind of war and creating the facilities that we need uh, in, in order to succeed in these kind of wars. So having the doctrine right helps. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. But it tells you, uh, or, or indicates to you at least, how to, to, to build all these other capabilities. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is there are very few indications that the American military is trying very hard to learn the lessons of its failures in Iraq and Afghanistan. Instead, it is turning uh, a new to uh, another big war as it did after Vietnam. After Vietnam, the uh, American military turned to preparing to fight a conventional war with the Soviet Union. While that war didn't happen, those were the forces that succeeded in Desert Storm. This time we're doing the same thing again. We are forgetting the lessons of, or, or not even trying to capture the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan and focusing on a coming war with China. I don't think that's smart because uh, as you look at a spectrum, a proposed spectrum of conflict, uh, I'll start on the right. Uh, I, I think general war is unlikely. I think war between uh, direct war uh, between American forces and Russian forces is unlikely. I think direct war, conventional war between Chinese forces and American forces is unlikely. I think that's true because of uh, American conventional superiority. And I think the war in Ukraine is reinforcing that, that American arms are um, relatively easy to use um, and and uh, are extraordinarily effective. We're seeing this in the war in Ukraine as uh, essentially American proxy forces. Uh, um, the Ukrainian troops are using American arms, allied arms with great effect. Um, so so that that I don't believe is going to go away. Uh, America's alliances, perhaps our, our, our most important asset uh, around the globe, are strengthening, not weakening. Uh, I, overall, by and large, some in, in some cases, they're, they're, they're not getting stronger. Uh, it, it's a uh, um, great sorrow to me that, that um, uh, for instance, President Biden isn't going to be able to, to, to meet with the Quad, including our Indian friends, because he has to come back home this weekend for... Uh, budget negotiations, debt ceiling negotiations 
with Congress, but but uh, the alliance with India, the Quad Alliance, I think is a, an important counter to China. It will cause China to think more than once. Um, uh, uh, and, and also American uh, and allied nuclear weapons, I think, put a lid on how far people are willing to go, how far countries are willing to go uh, in, in, in order to achieve their, their objectives through force of, force of arms. So that's the good news. I think there's a bunch of factors pushing, uh, making it less likely that we're going to see general war in the near term. That's the good news. The bad news is there's a whole bunch of things that also make stable peace less likely. Uh, climate change, which is affecting uh, the, the most vulnerable uh, countries uh, in the world, many of the most um, vulnerable countries in the world first. Uh, radical uh, radical um, terror groups have not gone away, both uh, radical Islamist groups, but, but uh, domestic groups in a number of countries, including the United States, uh, pose a threat. Um, population growth is is slowing down, but but uh, continues to put increasing demands on world resources, which are being depleted. And the very fact that we continue to fail in these small wars are all going to make it more likely that our enemies, seeing the difficulty of fighting us, defeating us in general war, are going to, I believe, continue to choose to fight us uh, as uh, irregular combatants. And so, my conclusions are the United States, our friends and allies around the globe have to retain readiness and capability for conventional war to deter and if necessary to fight and win. But we have to look at the world from our enemy's perspective. We have to assume that our enemies are gonna avoid our strengths and try to attack us in our weak spots. And the record shows, this talk shows, that opponents who fight the US on land conventionally are gonna lose decisively and quickly. Uh, as uh, Iraq did in, in Desert Storm. But those who practice irregular war, guerrilla warfare, and insurgency can wait us out and succeed, hoping that our domestic population will cause us to decide no longer to fight. Therefore, I believe we have to become as capable at the low end of the spectrum of conflict as we are at the high end to deter, and if necessary, win across the entire spectrum of conflict. And that means we need to invest more in those areas than we currently are. And if we don't, I'm afraid we're going to see helicopters off of the roof of embassies again. Uh, and that's horrible for the United States. It's horrible for our allies around the globe. It is, of course, most horrible for our friends who we leave behind in places like Vietnam, in places like Afghanistan, who suffer horribly as a result of our errors. And with that, I will yield the floor for questions at 11.39, my time, exactly one minute earlier than requested. Over. Thank you, Dr. Nagel, for sharing your valuable insights with us today on the theme of the strategy and counterinsurgency, what of 21st century. Your presentation was informative and thought-provoking, especially in emphasizing the importance of adapting to the evolving nature of warfare and recognizing the crucial role in non-military factors such as economics, the oneness, and diplomacy play in achieving success in modern conflicts. You mentioned the Spanish-American War and its significance in the evolution of modern U.S. military strategy, which was very interesting. Philippines has had a complicated history with the U.S., shaped by both military and cultural factors. World War I and II also had a significant impact on the U.S.-Philippines relationship, and it's interesting to consider how these historical events have influenced contemporary military strategy in the region. The emphasis on the Korean War, Vietnam War, and more recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan brought to the light the importance of counterinsurgency tactics tactics and winning the hearts and minds of the local population. Your insights into unconventional warfare and the need for flexibility in strategy, as well as an emphasis on investment in, dip uh, in diplomacy and governance, highlights the complexity of modern warfare and the need for a multifaceted approach. The Operation Desert Storm example you provided was a sobering reminder of the importance of careful planning, cooperation between military and civilian leadership, and the need to learn from the past mistakes. Hegemony in the contemporary world carries with it a significant responsibility in shaping global security. And your call for strategic planning that recognizes the multipolarity of 
the modern era and the importance of building relationships with partners and allies around the world is certainly well taken. The Information Operations and Post Nation Security Forces discussed also shed light on the importance of understanding and leveraging technology in modern warfare. The doctrine, organizations, training, material, leadership and education, personal and facilities model you mentioned is a valuable tool in ensuring that all aspects of military strategy are effectively addressed and coordinated. The addition of spectrum of conflict, including climate change, radicalism, population growth, resource depletion, and cybersecurity risks, etc., emphasizes the need for a comprehensive approach that takes into account both traditional and non traditional security concerns. In military strategy, requires a comprehensive approach that recognizes the evolving nature of warfare and the importance of non-military factors such as diplomacy and governance. It provided us with a proper understanding of modern military strategy and the challenges that we face in the world of the 21st century and the way ahead. I look forward to hearing more from you in our next Q&A segment. Now let's take some questions. So in reference to the World War I, uh, how did the development and use of new technologies such as artillery, machine guns, and chemical weapons in military strategy in the World War One. That's a terrific question. Uh, it's a big question. Um, Europe thought of um, war still in the light of Napoleon, the Franco-Prussian War, the wars of June, German unification, so that uh, military forces maneuvered uh, and, and fought big battles, which were won relatively quickly and decisively in short order. The, the, this was the thinking throughout the 19th century leading up to the First World War. The um, American Civil War had, had demonstrated otherwise, had demonstrated that um, rifling of weapons, that uh, digging in uh, in building trenches that uh, artillery on the modern battlefield made the defense a much stronger form of war and made it unlikely that quick victories were possible as they had been for Napoleon, as they had been uh, in, among others, the Franco-Prussian War. And, and those weapons, so, so, so uh, the American Civil War is viewed by many military historians as a, a precursor to the First World War, uh, a, a war taught with uh, 20th century weapons and uh, 18th century tactics, it's, it's often called. Um, and, and, and so um, Europe was unprepared for the slow grinding attrition warfare that marked the First World War. And, and that led to, to just the, the, the destruction of so much of Europe and, and so much human potential, 20 million dead in the war, uh, another 20 million dead as a result of the, the great influenza epidemic of 1918, uh, which, which started at an American military base. Uh, we now believe Camp Funston uh, spread uh, um, uh, across uh, Europe across the world and, and was able to spread so successfully um, in no small part because of weakened populations affected as a result of the First World War. World War I technology also had important implications for guerrilla warfare. Um, guerrilla warfare is more successful if weapons are democratized, if, if it isn't just armies, uh, national forces, uh, countries that have powerful weapons, but if small groups can also have them. And, and so the invention of dynamite, um, uh, portable machine guns gave, for instance, Lawrence of Arabia the power to lead an insurgent band uh, with enormous success and enormous effect uh, and, and ultimately uh, play a significant role in defeating Turkey, uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire, a great power at the time. Uh, with a relatively small number of, of insurgents uh, swimming among the sea of the people using hit and run tactics, 
uh, ambushes guerrilla warfare in a way that um, uh, was, was even more successful because of, of new technology like TNT than, for instance, the, the Spaniards fighting against Napoleon's invasion of, of their country had been a hundred years earlier. So one of the threads as we study warfare, as we think about strategy, is the evolution of technology and what it means for warfare. Uh, and and um, we, we, we saw this all the way through the Iraq and Afghanistan wars with improvised explosive devices, giving great destructive power to relatively small terror groups, uh, and uh, all the way through to nuclear weapons, in my eyes, making the world safe for small wars and irregular wars. Great question. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagel, for your analytical answer. Coming to the next question. Can the presence of heightened Islamophobia in the United States be considered a contributing factor to the effectiveness of counterinsurgency efforts, especially in the Middle East and the North Africa MENA region, including Afghanistan and Iran? Additionally, to what extent have instances of Islamophobia within the U.S. impacted the recruitment and retention of local partners and allies in counterinsurgency endeavors? That's a terrific question. Um, and and uh, I, I think the answer is, is mixed. Um, I give George W. Bush great credit for um, not waging a war on Islam broadly, for visiting mosques, in the aftermath of September 11th and, and for asking the American people um, not to demonize all Middle Easterners, all Muslims um, in the in the wake of, of that horrific attack on America. That said, uh, George W. Bush was responsible for the decision to invade Iraq, another Muslim country, in March of 2003, despite the fact that Iraq had nothing whatsoever to do with the attacks of September 11th, uh, as, as well as for a uh, poorly planned, poorly um, executed uh, aftermath of the initial invasion. The initial invasion was well planned, but we didn't know what to do with Iraq once we had toppled Saddam's government. Peter Bergen, an, an analyst of um, the wars of the last two decades, um, a man who as a CNN correspondent interviewed bin Laden uh, before the attacks of September 11th, literally in a cave in Afghanistan, uh, Peter Bergen says that um, after September 11th, uh, the American response to September 11th, the toppling of, of the Taliban, the scattering of Al-Qaeda, um, that, that uh, Al-Qaeda was on the run, that Al-Qaeda was uh, ineffective, that radical terrorism was, was really on the ropes, and that George W. Bush's decision to invade Iraq in March of 2003 gave new energy to radical Islamists, uh, dramatically increased recruiting for uh, terror groups, led to uh, a whole um, new generation of terrorists. And, and so I, 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 I agree with that assessment. So I, the invasion of Iraq was a huge mistake for the United States, and it, it accelerated the need. The war in Iraq accelerated anti-Muslim feelings among many in the United States as American troops uh, were, were killed, wounded uh, at, at horrific numbers in Iraq, all an unnecessary war that did uh, very little good for anybody. Uh, I think Saddam was bad, but but uh, and, 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 and it, it is good that he is gone. But the cost both suffered both by the Iraqi people and the American people uh, was was um, hugely excessive. Um, I, I think also I'll close close by noting uh, Peter thinks that uh, uh, August fifteenth, twenty twenty one, the day the uh, um, Afghan government fell and the Taliban regained control of Afghanistan, was also a terrific day for global jihadis, and and I I, I think that that. Uh, um, the, the fall of, of Afghanistan to the Taliban in 2021 was another American policy failure um, created by all of the administrations, Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden, all, all share some of the blame for that, uh, that failure, which I think has also done enormous damage around the globe. Thank you for your response, Dr. Nagel. Coming to the next question. 
how do you look at the Ukrainian strategy in the ongoing war with Russia, particularly at the operational level? The Ukrainian defense has been much better than initially expected, whereas Russia has failed to perform its offensive operations adequately. How do you see the future trajectory of this conflict? Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been privileged this year to lead a, a pretty big study at the Army War College of the Russo-Ukrainian War. Uh, I had 15 students, um, all colonels, lieutenant colonels and colonels working on it, uh, half a dozen faculty members. And we just briefed that work um, here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we're we're uh, at, at uh, the U.S. Army War College's Strategic Land Power Conference. I think there's tapes of it uh, on, on YouTube if you're interested. And we'll, we're continuing to brief it to uh, American and international audiences. I'll be briefing it this summer at a NATO conference in, uh, um, in Europe. So I thought about this a lot. Um, you, Ukraine's performance has uh, surprised me. I thought that they would fight well, um, but but uh, um, I, I did not think that they would be able to stand uh, against the full force of Russia, a country that's some three times bigger. Um, Russia's performance has also surprised me. It's been worse than I expected. And so I expected, as most analysts did, I think, that, that the Ukrainian government would fall relatively quickly, that Kyiv would fall. Uh, and I expected then that the Ukrainians would fight an insurgency and try to bleed the Russians out in the same way the Taliban bled the United States out in uh, in, in Afghanistan, the same way uh, the Mujahideen bled the Russians out, the Soviets out in Afghanistan. Uh, instead, because the Russians were worse than I thought, the Ukrainians were better than I thought, the Ukrainians um, had, had uh, more help than I'd expected. From a number of, of different sources. Um, the, the Ukrainians stood, they, they withstood the initial onslaught. They uh, counterattacked in the fall and recovered a lot of the ground that they had lost earlier. And they are, according to all accounts, preparing to counterattack again, this time with even more advanced weapon systems, including my beloved M1 Abrams tanks. Uh, I expect the Ukrainians to continue to do well, to punch above their weight, uh, to, to do um, grave damage to Russia, which is being bled dry, not in a counterinsurgency campaign, but in a conventional, almost World War I style war. Um, I, I wonder, uh, I expect um, Ukraine to regain all of the territory uh, it has lost in the East over the last decade or so, 15 years. Um, where, where I wonder uh, is Crimea. The Crimean Peninsula is of enormous importance to Vladimir Putin personally. And I have a hard time believing that he would be willing to give it up. And I believe that he might use weapons of mass destruction uh, against the Ukrainians in order to preserve it. Uh, I expect, I would be surprised if the United States has not made clear to Putin that any escalation of the war would result in um, uh, even more devastation than Russia has suffered to date, both economically and militarily. Uh, but but uh, it, it's hard to, to predict what Putin will do. Um, I've, I've argued in print uh, that, that uh, we might have to settle for uh, a Ukraine that has restored its territory in the east, uh, but but that uh, as part of a ceasefire, for now at least, uh, probably until Putin is gone, uh, accepts uh, Russians in Crimea for some little while. I don't like that, but I'm afraid with Putin, the cost of regaining Crimea may be greater uh, than than the benefit of regaining it. Great question. I, th I think we probably have time for one more. And then, sorry, I've got another talk I have to give it at uh, noon my time. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagel. Coming to the next question. What were the significant shortcomings or vulnerabilities uh, identified in World War I that military forces are currently addressing? Furthermore, do you believe that military strategies can be enhanced through the integration of new technologies such as artificial intelligence? Yeah. Uh, so, so world the big problem with World War One was that we hadn't fully developed the internal combustion engine, uh, and and so um, the the way to defeat 
uh, machine guns in trenches and artillery, it turns out, is tanks, main battle tanks. Um, and, and this is why it's so important that Ukraine is, is uh, getting main battle tanks from Europe and from the United States, uh, from allies around the globe. Uh, mobile protected firepower, which is what a tank is, can defeat the the um, can defeat trenches, barbed wire, and uh, machine guns, and and I, I believe we're going to see another illustration of that here sooner than later. By the fall, I would expect uh, Ukraine to have rega regained control of some, if not all, of its territory in the east. And, and technology continues to change and develop. Uh, I, I would be surprised if artificial intelligence is not being used already. Uh, I know it is um, in, in uh, a number of weapon systems to do things like uh, deconflict airspace for uh, ar artillery fires, um, to uh, prioritize uh, air defense targets. We've seen some terrific air defense successes by my Ukrainian friends here just in the past week. I think artificial intelligence is a part of that. And I think the application of artificial intelligence to war fighting systems, both uh, in the air, uh, in the sea and on the ground is going to be the next big step forward in war. Uh, and I, I think we'll, we'll see um, possibly, uh, very possibly fewer battlefield losses of soldiers as increasingly it will be robots that do the fighting that has super interesting ethical and moral implications. It doesn't mean that warfare is going to be less bloody because wars will likely continue to be conducted among the people, but it's possible that, that the soldiers um, who, who do the fighting, like uh, many of the aviators who've been fighting in the wars of the past 20 years, have been doing that remotely uh, with drones, uh, I think that's the next step forward in warfare. So thanks for your questions. Thank you, Dr. John A. Nagel, for giving an excellent overview on today's theme, military strategy and counterinsurgency wars of the 21st century. Your insights shed light on the importance of adapting military strategy to changing times and recognizing the complexities of modern conflicts, especially in counterinsurgency operations. Furthermore, the need to prioritize community development and peace building efforts in addition to military combat operations cannot be understated. The military thinking and approach of the past may not always apply to, to, to today's unconventional warfare conditions. It is therefore encouraging to see that renewed efforts are being made to apply lessons learned from past conflicts such as the Vietnam War, Korean War, World War I, II, etc., and incorporate them into new strategies for tackling the evolving nature of warfare in the 21st century. Additionally, military integration and with intelligence agencies and a continuous learning process will be paramount in ensuring effective counterinsurgency practices. As we move forward, it is clear that effective counterinsurgency will require a multi-dimensional approach that prioritizes the protection of non-combatants and addresses the root causes of conflict. In conclusion, we must acknowledge that war in the 21st century require a new mindset that recognizes their complexity and fluidity while also, keep, uh, while also keeping in mind the importance of adapting and learning to stay ahead. Thank you for your time today, Dr. Nagel, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. I'm sure our audience for today has gained valuable knowledge and learning from your lecture. Thank you so much, take care. Thank you.